we're dealing with remote companies, so we were going to ask our participants, are you fully remote, partially remote, or are you just thinking about getting into the game of going remote, uh, just to get a feel of uh, your extent with this uh, new way of working. Great. So can everybody in the um, audience type in the chat panel if they are, how distributed they are, if they are partly distributed, fully distributed, or um, anything else? <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. And the chat panel, you should have a little control there on your team. So fully, partially, or thinking about going distributed. And you can click on the chat panel in the GoToWebinar controller and type your answers in there if you're inclined. Okay. All right. All right. Let's just go ahead and move on. All uh, right. Uh, let's see here. So next slide. Here's our agenda for the day. Uh, we are going to meet the panelists, Adam and Dave. Um, we're going to talk about... Uh, hiring remote people and what you do about that. We'll do a little bit of talking about taxes and then we'll talk about financial management and remote companies. And then we'll talk about uh, the little goodie bag we're gonna send out to everybody after the session. And we'll have a little time for Q and A with our wonderful uh, participants here. So moving on, apologize for the uh, uh, issues with this. <laughs> Seems that uh, the latest update was not that awesome. Okay, that probably looks better, huh? All right. So, Dave, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, absolutely. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, my name's Dave Danick. I work in the tax department of Summit CPA Group. Uh, we are a, a CPA firm based in Northeast Indiana, but we are becoming more and more remote. Um, uh, I've been with the firm uh, just for about four months now, uh, but I've been a CPA working in public practice since 06. And somehow, some way, I discovered taxes to be fun. Uh, it's March 31st, and uh, I don't know how true that statement is anymore. But anyways, it's great <laughs> to be here, and uh, thanks, thanks for, thanks for uh, joining us. Oh, thank you, Dave. <laughs> I love these cartoons. They're great. Adam. Yeah, I don't you? know. Yeah. Thanks for that, Dave. Yeah, I don't know which one's weirder. That picture of, of Dave over there or the, uh, the that he finds taxes to be fun. I, on the <laughs> other hand, do not. So, um, and, and my name is Adam Hale. Um, I'm a co-founder and virtual CFO at Summit CPA Group, uh, where I primarily focus my time as a business strategist for service-based businesses. And, uh, you know, I've been office free for two years now. So that's my, right. my little claim. Yeah. Love that. Love that. Uh, I'm Mandy Ross. If you've been to our webinars before, you've heard my voice. Um, and I'm the director of marketing and agile practices for Sococo. Uh, I've worked at big companies, small companies, everywhere in between. Uh, my background's largely in engineering, but I've moved into marketing because it's more fun. Uh, and I've also been a tel telecommuter forever, so I have a lot of experience in this area. And I'm really happy that um, our customers, partners, and friends at Summit CPA uh, were willing to take this time <laughs> right before tax season is over, um, their busiest time of the year, to uh, talk to our wonderful audience about these issues. So let's get started. It's time to talk about money. All right. Take it away, Summit All right. CPA. Yeah, so uh, this is Dave, and uh, you know we're going to start with the boring part of the presentation first. Uh, no, it's not going to be that bad, uh, but you know w because we are dealing with remote companies, we obviously have to uh, deal with employees that are going to be crossing state lines. So you might have that one employee that comes to you and said, "My spouse got transferred, uh, and well, I want to move with them, but." you don't want to waste the thousands of dollars of training that you've already invested into them by just saying, well, see you later, go find another job. No, we want to retain our staff uh, and then also uh, keep them to be productive for the company. Uh, and as I start uh, going into this, I, I'd like to say you have my sympathy when it comes to hiring people remotely. And what I mean by that, it is confusing, uh, especially as we start getting into multi-state taxation matters. Um, it's definitely one of the most uh, confusing areas of our practice. Um, and why is that? Well, we have 50 different states. Each state 
may have different city taxes, county taxes, school district taxes, transit taxes, the list goes on and on. So at the end of the day, there are thousands of different vari variations of taxes that can apply to us as a remote employer. Uh, and as we go through this webinar, um, I would love to answer every specific situation that you may be bringing to the table, uh, but I'm not too proud to admit that I don't have all the answers because there are thousands of different variations that can, that can arise. So when we're working with our clients, what I want to do is I want to give them some confidence as they go into this hiring mode of remote, em remote employees. Um, so you're not losing out on the talent that's out there, okay? Um, and as an employer, I know it's easy to push this kind of stuff off to the back burner, but I highly recommend you take care of these uh, taxation issues on the front end because it's eventually going to come back. So um, as we get started, I just want to uh, let you know that with our clients, we just want to give them the tools to go into this confidently. So you've hired someone new. Um, and the three general questions that I want my clients to focus on, uh, if you can switch the slide here, um, are what taxes am I required to pay? Am I an employer in that state? And then if I am an employer, do I withhold or pay? Okay, so if I have an employee, Joe, that wants to move to California, the first step that I want you to ask as an employer, what taxes could apply in California? So if I go to the next slide, please, Mandy. Um, there are many different variations. There's income tax. That's one that's quite popular and we all know about it. Uh, you have to withhold it as the employer and then remit it to the state taxing agency. Uh, there's state unemployment taxes. Uh, that's also a popular one that's paid by the employer. But then the states start getting a little different here. Um, we have state disability taxes. So um, if, an in, if a worker is injured, they might be able to apply for disability benefits to the state rather than relying on a private disability insurance plan. Well, that's a tax that's on the employer. However, as the employer, you may be able to recoup some of that cost from the employee. So now we have a tax on two people. And then lastly, as we move into these new jurisdictions, we have local taxes, all right? And again, that could be both a withholding scenario or uh, a tax that's just directly placed on the employer. So we have our California example. Yes, they have income taxes. Yes, they have unemployment taxes. Yes, they have the disability insurance tax. And then when I'm in the local, well, that's a big maybe. So for instance, if I hire someone in San Francisco, they have an employer tax that's based upon the gross payroll that I paid to that employee. So then I have to ask my employee, really what part of San Francisco are you moving to? All right, so now I've got to get my head wrapped around all these different types of taxes and I move on to step two. And then I start asking, am I an employer in that state? So what do we mean by this? Well, I say, do I have nexus? Nexus is just a fancy term that helps uh, determine whether or not an employer has enough presence in a particular state to make it responsible for reporting, all right? Because we're on a Sococo webinar and we're dealing with remote employees, um, most likely, if you have a telecommuting or work at home employee on your staff, there's a really good chance that you're going to have Nexus in that state. Uh, last time I checked, I believe 48 out of the 50 states have a specific rule or court case that suggested that if you have a work at home employee, even if they are just doing some level of administrative task, not directly selling a product, you have created nexus in that state, okay? Um, and then as I gravitate more and more into states, there's other types of ways to create that nexus. 
that might not be totally based on just having an employee. If I have an office in that state, well, that's a pretty big physical presence. Yeah, I've got Nexus. Uh, am I having someone taking orders in the state? Again, a physical presence case where, yeah, it probably creates Nexus. But there's other things such as advertising in a state, uh, licensing products, uh, just delivering a product into the state uh, that can create these types of nexus issues that make me responsible as an employer to register and report into that state. So now I've covered two of the first three questions. I've already figured out that California has a whole bunch of taxes that I have to look at. I've also determined that, yes, I've created a nexus environment, so I am responsible as an employer for uh, reporting in that state. So then I have to go ask my third question, what do I do with all these taxes? So really, I'm going to focus on the uh, top two I mentioned, which are the income tax withholding uh, and the state unemployment, uh, because those are the two that are really going to be the most prevalent in all the states that we go into. And for our work at home employees, the withholding occurs for the state where the work is performed. So if I did have that employee that went from state A to state B, I wasn't hold, withholding an A, and then as they moved to B, where they were performing their work has switched, and then I will have to withhold in that state B because they have changed their physical presence. And it really comes down to the butt rule. Okay, where does the employee wake up? Where do they stick their butt in the chair and work that day? Even if it's in their house, if it's in that state, you're most likely going to have to withhold in that state. Okay, now if I have an employee that comes back to me and says, wait, I don't want you to withhold in this state that I'm at. You know, maybe they don't like the tax rate. Uh, maybe they don't want to be reported in that state. For telecommuters, it's, it's the employer's responsibility to uh, derive from the employee where his or her residency. And that residency is really going to be the, the backstop on where you withhold. So if they've moved, they've rented a new apartment, bought a house, changed their voter registration, got a driver's license in a new state, then, you know, there's a great chance that you're going to have to withhold in that new state. Um, and you just wanna make sure you're protected, uh, that you're not, uh, the state's not gonna come back at you and say, well, where is all this withholding money? I mentioned uh, the third bullet point we got here is this reciprocal agreement and there's a question mark. Um, uh, so why is there a question mark? Well, a lot of that applies to uh, employees that work and reside in a different state. And it's going to be um, really due to an employee that's going to be traveling from state A to state B to work. Um, and what happens is they just, the states don't want to have employees that are subject to multiple withholding or multiple levels of taxation in two different states. So in general, the agreements are going to specify that the employer should withhold the income taxes on the non-resident employee's wages only for the worker's home state and not subject to the income tax rules of the state where the wages are earned. So I know I've kind of navigated away from the work at home, but if I'm in Indiana and have an employee that lives in Ohio but comes into Indiana, I'm going to be withholding uh, on those Ohio wages. But again, it creates an obligation for me to register in that other state. Um, and a very important tool for you as you go into these new states is to get the employee to use the state-specific W-4. Uh, that is something that's signed by the employee that authorizes that withholding to occur in the new state. So if a state that you're going into has a W-4, please use it, it's there for a reason. Um, and uh, again, it's just more protection for you as you travel into new states. What we're also starting to see more as the working, working, 
Did we lose our panelist? Hey guys. Hi there. Um, are we back? Let's see here. The employee is in state A versus state B, and then break out those wages and withhold appropriately in those two states. Um, it's protection for you, and it's going to place the burden on the employee at the end of the year when they do their personal taxes. Uh, you know, they'll probably have to file taxes in two different states, but again, they perform services in two different states. So uh, lucky you employers, you have to register and withhold in uh, two different states. Now I have two other bullet points here. There's the volume of business ratio and the mileage basis. Uh, the volume of business ratio, that's uh, another way to break out that income, but that's mostly going to be for your traveling salesperson uh, who's working on commission and is, uh, has a lot more sales in one state versus another. And then the mileage basis, you know, even states get down to so much details as how much miles did a delivery driver drive in a particular state. Okay, so, um, you know, a lot of these nitpicky rules are coming into play because state budgets are becoming more and more constrained. And while it's super, super confusing for us as employers, don't you just have to deal with it. So again, that comes back to me saying, I, I am sympathetic for you as it becomes more and more confusing. Uh, next, uh, the second layer of tax is that state unemployment tax. So if you pop over to the next slide, I believe that should pop up here. Um, I want to bring this one up because states don't want you paying unemployment taxes to, do for, to two different states at the same time because they don't want to have to pay out the unemployment tax benefits uh, to the uh, laid off employee. Um, I guess another way to say it is they don't want the same person claiming benefits in two different states. So as the employer who is responsible for paying those taxes in, uh, you know, you have to figure out what state to, uh, to pay the taxes in to. Well, there's a four part test and you go down these four different line items to determine where to pay it in. The first and the easiest is the localization of service. And for our telecommuting and work at home employees, that's a pretty easy one to determine. Their service is localized where they are performing the service. Okay, uh, and they're not going to be moving many different places. So if their residency has changed, they're working at home, uh, you're going to be paying the unemployment tax to that new state. Now, but what about that employee that says they want to work in uh, two different states in equal amount of time? And we have seen this. Where do I pay the unemployment taxes to? They haven't changed their residency, but they are definitely uh, have, they have two different localized places of service. Well, the next layer is the base of operations. So we go back and look at the employer and say, hey, at the end of the day, this employer started in my home state. That's where our physical office is. And if we have to call them back to this state, then that is where we're going to pay those taxes in. So um, a lot of times, if you do have that employee that wants to move part time uh, or for a few months to another state, most likely you're going to be keeping the unemployment taxes in your home state. Um, but I do also recommend, and it's okay call the Department of Workforce Development or whatever it might be called in your home state and ask them. And they might give you a more clear cut answer to say, uh, this is where you should be paying those taxes to. Uh, the bottom two, you're probably not going to uh, run into. Um, 
the place of direction and control is mostly for a traveling salesperson where, you know, if they're going to eight different states in the Midwest and they're always on the road, it's a little bit more difficult to determine. And then uh, the last fallback is really where the residence of the employee is if we can't determine based upon the first three steps of where to pay those unemployment taxes. Okay. And then uh, just a couple other notes as we get into a telecommuting uh, environment, um, just a couple other notes to consider here. A few states have something called the convenience of employer rules. And this is a pretty nasty rule that states put in because they wanted to get some more tax revenue. So uh, just to give you an example of how it works, New York 10 years ago, uh, they set up a rule where they wanted to ensure that non-resident workers couldn't reduce their liability by working at home. So if their home technically wasn't in New York, uh, you know, the employee could say, well, I'm just going to work out of state at my house so I don't have to pay the New York state taxes. Well, New York said, no, thank you. Um, and simply put, they put a rule in. So the days worked at home were treated as New York work days unless it was out of state by necessity. So there was a double layer of taxation for these employees. Uh, you know, they had the New York taxes and then their home state. Um, they've kind of eased off this rule a little bit by saying, okay, if you do work at home, you have to prove the office space uh, that you are working in. Uh, difficult to prove, uh, but nonetheless, there have been court cases uh, where New York is going after employers to get some of that withholding money if they do win in, in court, and they have. And there's also a few other states that have these rules as well. So be careful there. A um, couple other tips as you move into a remote working environment. Um, check your disability insurance carriers. You know, um, if you do have an employee that's moving into a new state, you want to make sure your insurance provider covers uh, that new state. Um, and then also, I know firsthand, it's really easy to rely on your payroll tax software or your payroll tax provider to do this kind of stuff right. Um, but basically, the software only can work and put the be careful on the for all your registrations and registration numbers are up to date with these new states. And then educate to your payroll provider uh, on how to um, on how to withhold, how to pay unemployment taxes, et cetera. And then I'm also seeing a lot of companies get in trouble when they do move into a new forms are not supported by a payroll company. So that still falls upon uh, the employer to fill that out. Just to able to look um, yeah, I find this. This is a really cool free website um, that you can click into each state in the union and it tells you how to register, where to register, what type of tax taxes exist in that state. Um, and it's just, a, I've used this tool uh, a lot and it's just as comprehensive as a lot of the tools that we pay for as well. So um, um, write this down, check it out. It's got websites, phone numbers uh, on who to call in these particular states. And uh, so I, I highly encourage you to, to use this resource right here. Um, other than that, again, it's, uh, it's fun being in a remote company, but it definitely opt up. I didn't have the, the chat window open, but um, we'll definitely have some time afterwards and hopefully we can address them. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, sir. Um, for our listeners, I apologize. GoToWebinar is having a very bad day today, and it does not like processing audio. So um, I apologize for any glitches that um, happen on behalf of Citrix. All right, our next section is financial management and remote companies. 
Go ahead, gents, take it away. The, yeah, this is Abby. First question learned over the last uh, um, I don't know, relates to like in particular. I think one of the biggest things that we've learned is that you know it, it's not any harder to manage a distributed. Uh, it's uh, more or less costly to manage uh, you know a uh, a traditional team versus a distributed team, and you know. As you'd expect, you know, there's a lot of things that you have to do to really pull off a distributed or remote model, you know, in terms of, you know, you have to make sure, for instance, that you have um, more communication um, and that you uh, build a sense of community. And so, you know, my experience being in an office and a physical office, at least, has been that, you know, sometimes that communication can be disruptive and, you know, culture has a tendency to just kind of happen more organically without perhaps aligning itself to the company values. So overall, I guess what we've learned is that, uh, you know, I feel like we've, we've learned to be really deliberate about effectively uh, communicating with one another and really understanding the need to build a strong sense of community, which, you know, both of those obviously have financial impacts. Um, on that slide back there, uh, if you could go back one, um, you know, there's uh, Milton from Office Space and his, uh, and his red stapler. I'm sure a lot of folks are familiar with him, um, but this is probably a good time for me to, to come clean. Um, in you know, full disclosure, we're not a fully distributed. Do have them ago? we bought into the notion that owning self rental commercial real estate was a good thing. And, you know, for some folks, it, it is still a good thing, but you know, for most service based businesses that don't necessarily need a physical location, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. And so, you know, in fact, we have it, you know, started driving some of our decisions, which is, is definitely a bad thing. So, you know, coming back to Milton here, whenever I see him, I am down. But going, going back application slide there, um, one of the biggest questions that always comes up whenever we talk about teams or remote uh, working is will it save us money? Uh, sometimes that seems to be kind of the primary mode of in the, sh in the uh, while us are maybe to spend that money in a better or more meaningful manner to to help promote the the community that you're trying to. Build in your organization. So, the some of the costs. I think we're on there. Mandy, if you can, there you go. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, Dave's already called, covered all the. Applications. He did a fantastic job, you know, scaring a lot of all of us about all the different things that we have to do, the ramifications of having folks in other states. Um, so, you know, the the only thing we now have the taxes, as Dave has mentioned, a lot of come in and say they're going to do it, um, but it's been our relying on to facilitate this. That's used to that's versed in multi-state, so that you can you can kind of navigate through the complexities. So the additional um, going on to the next slide here, a picture. Of
Wow. Uh... So uh, a little bit of a drag. Uh, no big deal. I made a picture of Mandy's home office. You can tell it's a big <laughs> executive suite there. So, um, you know, <laughs> I guess is so whenever we're talking about costs and financial things, you have a new hire, they're going to need some software in order to get going. And what we do is we start all of our new hires out with a care package for our remote folks. And so that includes things like a fully loaded piece monitors or a scanner, and of course a camera. Um, probably missing a few things there. But again, you're in terms of bundling it up as a package and sending it off, you, you are physically, um, you know, moving that on. So something to kind of consider. But after um, that initial care package and moving on to the next slide there and talking more about how we, um, after that initial care package has been set out, we shift the responsibility of maintaining and replacing that equipment to our staff. And we do that through tech stipends and then via these PEX cards. So, and our firm in particular offers the $2,000 a year tech. Most of our clients are generally in that range, somewhere to $1,500 to as high as $2,500 a year, but, but $2,000 is a good rough average and that's what we use. And so every month our firm administrator, what, what she'll do is she'll go in and she'll load one twelfth of that annual balance onto these prepaid PEX cards uh, that the staff can use for upgrading and replacing hardware. They can use it to purchase office supplies such as ink and paper. Um, and we even allow our staff to pay for their internet bill with this card. Uh, the, the biggest takeaway here though, is making sure that they understand that they're gonna be responsible for replacing their machine when they need to budget accordingly. That's a big expense. Uh, and machines usually are on average, so by $1,000, room in there to, to budget for that. So they just need to be responsible. Um, you know, and, and like anything else, you know, in order to maintain this tax-free benefit to your team members, there are some housekeeping items associated with it that you have to keep in mind that you still have to maintain and keep receipts, even though, because that PEX card is technically ours. It lives on the company balance sheet. And so they're just using it. So the, as those receipts come in, uh, we have to do that to, to stay in the good graces with our friends at the IRS. Hey, Adam, do you mind yeah. if I add to that? You know, I, I, I use my PEX card to buy a backup internet um, you know, so I have two sources of internet to my house um, because when you are remote, obviously you re you rely on the internet to uh, get your work done. Uh, but even if you aren't remote too, uh, uh, if you're <laughs> if the office's internet goes out, they're not working either. So I mean, <laughs> there's just uh, so many. Uh, so I just that's uh, just to give an example of how I use my PEX card uh, to buy that secondary source of internet. Yeah, no, that's a that's a good point. We have a one internet limit at our office, so I'll make sure to let Kathy. Know. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, no. Uh, <laughs> hey, uh, uh, yeah. So I mean, you know, so this is this is kind of one tool that we use to to stipends, but other tools that we use, um, we've got them listed here. Um, you know, it's you know, going back to the text to the text stipend, that last one there, Expensify on the bottom of the page. That's what we use to facilitate um, collecting and retaining our receipts. So there's a lot of software programs out there that can help you do this and manage that. Uh, we just found as an office that we wanted to champion one solution and wanted to become an expert in that. And for us, it just happened to be Expensify. So, you know, kind of working our way up the list there. Uh, most folks are probably very familiar with Slack. Uh, we use that for a lot of our internal communication. We try to avoid external, we use Slack internally. Um, you know, we create channels for each one of our clients so we have a dialogue about what's going on with each client. It's, uh, you know, very, uh, but probably the one that we've found the most effective and the one we use constantly and we're kind of lost without is that top one, Sococo. You know, for, for us, you know, I really can't say enough about the product. I mean, I, to the point where I joke sometimes that we sh should be on the payroll, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, 
<laughs> I'll work on really. That. I mean, at conferences, <laughs> we're we're popping it up on our laptops and our on our tablets and showing everybody how it works. And you know, in all seriousness, as I mentioned in the intro, that I, I've been remote for a couple of years now, but you know, I really didn't feel like it went well until we started using Sococo as our virtual office, uh, because it's really helped us create a sense of community with our team. You know, we do everything from our one-on-ones to our entire um, every at a Sococo. Everybody turns on their camera, shares some story. You know, so where within our organization, we all interact in the exact same way. There's four Sococo. You know, you would have these groups that were at the office or these groups that were located in a state, and they would interact differently as the whole company. And if you went into our Sococo now and you talk to people, there's no way you would know which people are in the office and which people are out of the office because we run all of our communication through there. I love hearing that. Uh, Really to the point in the rare instances. Yeah, I mean, in the office, even though there are people in there, I don't communicate, I don't have them come into my office to talk. It's just more efficient and it's a better way of communicating. I'm in my office, they're in their office. We hop on there, I have my resources, they have theirs, we can do some screen share, we can get in and out. And it just, it really helps the creative environment. Um, you know, inner office communication a lot of times. And so, you know, it's really easy to break off. And, and now that they've integrated Slack inside the Sococo, it's been, uh, you know, it's become pretty invaluable to us as a team. So, oh yeah, love hearing that. It is. It's uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it's fantastic. Um, yeah. I so, don't know how we ever, you know, kind of move integration actually. <laughs> anyway, go on. But no, it's it's actually it's worked out really well for us. I was uh, pleasantly surprised. So it's uh, it's been nice. Cool. We also use uh, all these tools at Sococo. We use Extensify, Slack, and Sococo. So good company. Great. Great minds, I tell you. Totally. <laughs> um, so, so another expense to kind of consider, um, it's rare, and we don't, we don't run into it as an organization, but there's a thing like, you know, the thing to consider is co-work spaces. And so what, what, what this, when this happens, you might find that somebody on your team might not feel comfortable working from home because they have living constraints, or they just want to be out of the house. Uh, so they might request, you know, hey, can I rent a small shared space from a local company? You know, that way they can get out of the office and just get refreshed. I mean, I personally struggled with this uh, before I, I lived in the home that I'm at right now. My space was so small, that I just felt like I, I couldn't connect to the office. And then once I I made it to home, get connected. And again, Tools like Sococo kind of helped bridge that gap. But again, not a huge deal and probably uh, not very, but something to gain for those folks that may. So, you know, we've talked about taxes. We've talked about, you know, potentially bumping up your profession professional fees, there's tech stipends that, you know, for technology and, and uh, software, you probably already invest in anyway. And at the beginning of my presentation, I told you that, that we find that most, whether you're, whether you're remote and mortar, that the costs are roughly right around the same. It's going to be a one for one. But all those things that I talked about are pretty minimal. Where the difference is, is right here these meeting where you can kind of redirect that money in a more meaningful manner. So to, so for instance, most service-based businesses we find spend about four and a half to 5% of their revenue on facility costs. If they have a physical location and with, uh, with a remote team uh, that most of those folks will use that money and redirect it for one, an annual company retreat, so the whole team gets together somewhere really cool and they bond. And then another annual one where they're broke up into little meetups. So they might be departmentalized, they might be by team, you know, however that might work. And the, the typical cost for one of these things is right around $1,500 to $2,000 per person. So if you're 
if you're building and your percentage of rent to income is in line, the, the total cost should also kind of follow that. And you can work within those budgets. The, the cool thing too is unlike rent, you have the ability to, to really budget for it and impact, you know, the cost there, you know, depending upon where you want it to go. So revenues down, you can do revenues up, you can decide to spend a little bit more. You don't have that freedom and flexibility with, uh, um, with a traditional uh, brick and mortar. So, and you know, if, uh, if these things, you know, scare you, like having to plan for this kind of stuff, keep in mind, there's professionals out there that pretty much do this for free because they make their money, you know, saving you on hotel fees and all that kind of stuff. And if you're using tools, the video conferencing tools like Sococo or GoToMeeting, it's been my personal experience. You know, I have a lot of clients all throughout the country. I have, I have staff all throughout the country and never met them. And then because we're using these video conferencing tools and, and talking on a regular basis, when we do get opportunities for these meetups or these retreats, it feels like, you know, I've known them and they've been in the office the whole time. It's, it's not awkward at all. And it's, it, uh, you know, no issue. So the meetups and the company retreats really help to create that sense of community that sometimes isn't even there in a brick and mortar whenever everybody's forced to kind of be in the same space. So that's where we get the one to one. So going on to the next slide there, you know, we've got some other advantages to consider, you know, whenever you're talking about being remote versus brick and mortar and kind of a byproduct of being a remote team, which is your ability to turn a traditionally fixed rent into a variable per person expense. You know, don't get me wrong. Um, sometimes you could spend percentage fixed and have a new up. But ability to turn your expenses into a flexible car. And I think that's actually probably up on the next slide there. Yeah, there you go. Um, but that's uh, powerful. You know, the, the ability from a forecasting side, that's what I spend most of my time doing is forecasting for clients and, and being able to tie those to head count uh, gives you a lot of flexibility as an owner to, to kind of, so moving on to the, to the next slide there, um, some other obvious advantages to remote, you know, running a remote team is your ability to, you know, expand your talent search. Um, you know, just imagine if American Idol had to limit its search to a small town in Indiana. Now, well, well, I'm sure Dave is a very talented singer. No disrespect. <laughs> I, I think in all seriousness, we would all agree that that would be a very limited talent pool. Um, so, uh, you know, that's our really town, not, uh, Our town does have an idol competition. Come on. <laughs> well, I know. Oh, well, okay. I picked that. Sorry, Dave. Um, but in most instances, if we go beyond that, um, that's no different than we are as business owners. You know, why not get people from all over the place? So, you know, from a financial standpoint, there are some advantages there too, because again, if you're a California based business and you can find somebody in Iowa or North Dakota, there could be tax savings opportunities. Of course, it goes the other direction too. You know, you could, you could um, end up spending more on, on people if you are in Arkansas and you try to hire somebody in California or New York. Um, so it, it slides both ways, but um, for, especially for the East coast and the West coast folks, and even down in Texas, trying to find folks in the Midwest, there can be savings opportunities there to, to lower the cost of talent. So something to consider, of course. Um, and then one of the uh, last thing impact is, uh, yes, a turnover. Mm. Um, you know, yeah. <laughs> mm. You know, wh while, uh, while that looks super yummy to eat, I don't think really any of that as, as a business. Um, you know, the fact is, is that uh, you're going to have turnover in any model you select. And sometimes that's a good thing. You know, it's not always a bad thing. However, whenever that turnover is created because a good team member 
move has to move away because a spouse landed a great job or they just want to be closer to their family that's not a good thing that's not the kind of turnover you want um so just like talent acquisition of uh you know i think being able to retain the talent is perhaps more important whenever you consider the cost of onboarding a new person to your team and, and so you know, kind of in close I'll, I'll give you an example that we recently ran into which which was you know lines right up with this we had a team member come to us and and tell us hey question for her was you know, do you have a good internet connection where you're going? Because as David mentioned earlier, that's really all we care about, the setup shop wherever you're going. And uh, of course, we were uh, pleasantly surprised to learn that in fact, they do have internet in the great, uh, you know, long story short, um, she took a couple days off, she moved, got settled in and really never skipped a beat. And so that was a huge win um, for her and her family as well for us. Uh, because again, you know, the ability to retain good talent is a big savings. And I think it offers a major competitive advantage. So hope that uh, uh, community to kind of get a couple takeaways there and, um, you know, be happy to answer a few questions. Great. Um... Cool. So I, uh, I apologize. There's a uh, um, just very crazy uh, webinar stuff going on today. So <laughs> um, I apologize in advance for uh, for that. So let's see here. Do we have any questions? Um, yeah, the audio is choppy, Mike. I'm sorry. I'm not sure what's going on with GoToWebinar. We've been very unhappy with their latest release. Um, so uh, yeah, I think I might work with these guys to maybe do this over again, uh, but we'll come up with something for sure because this is really great. Um, let's see. The next one is how does working in multiple states uh, issue work tax uh, wise when the business owner is the one moving forward rather than an employee? Good question. Um, well, because you're moving from state to Well, I think it could be just like that. So, you know, it's, so the ramifications would be the same. So if you're an S Corp, for example, and you're on the payroll, it'd be just like if an employee moved. Um, if, if you're, it's a little bit LLC and payment, you're not quite, but there's still allocation that has to happen there. And so you would uh, create nexus in that state where you where you live because it would be just like, um, you know, it's not going to be any more proportionate than if it was a team member that decided to go to that state. Cool. Would you agree, uh, Dave? Yeah, 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 very good question though, very good. Great. Uh, sorry, <laughs> there's a weird problem with my network too because that's the kind of day it is. The next question is for LLCs with pass-through taxation, do the owners and members always need to file personal income tax in states where remote employees work? Um, great question. Yeah, great question. Um, yes and no, of course. Every answer with taxes is depends, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's something uh, well, what we get into is um, and that's a fancy word of tell owner or business on how to spread out their income tax liability in between different jurisdictions. And the, that is based upon three different factors. Uh, there could be a sales factor, payroll factor, and a property factor. So uh, the popular 
one is uh, you know, spending more pocket based where your customer right there, you should pay the tax. Okay, yeah. the states are doing it that way. So, that, so you have to report your income based upon where your customer was. But the well, more traditional model. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Well, add to that basically and say that, you know, whenever it comes to the owner themselves, um, whether or not you personally have to file in one of those states or if the company files there, um, you know, just to kind of build on to that, if that's, if that's kind of where that question is heading, the answer is, is typically we will try to have the company um, file in that state and do a composite return as opposed to it flooding through to the personal but there are some states that do not have composite returns so instead of having all these states at the individual level we try to have them all at the corporate level but oftentimes what ends up happening is there's there's a dozen of them or so that are at the corporate level and a couple of them will sprinkle mm -hmm. down into the individual level yeah cool um, yeah, very good point. And um, yeah, we, another question that we could talk for days on. Um, feel free to get my email address. I'm sure we could find it somehow and we can maybe address more specifically. I was thinking, you guys, that in our uh, follow-up materials that we send out, um, we can have a clear way to contact you um, directly if mm -hmm. people want to work with you on these specifics. Absolutely. Okay. One last question here. Um, from Becca, which is in an entirely distributed team, how do you decide where to establish your official address? Um, you know, really that depends. Typically what we find is that the owner usually establishes that. Like most distributed, fully distributed teams had a starting point or a base. And so that question doesn't come up a ton. If it if you start it off completely distributed, I would say that's typically going to be in the state where the owner is. And the reason being is because or where the, the managing partner or whoever that person is, whoever has that contact with the attorney, because you know, you're gonna have registered agents in all these different states and some of it's just an actual service, but your primary attorney is gonna be the one handling all the incorporation and doing all that kind of paperwork. And so they're going to wanna to have it ideally in the state where they're located because they're gonna be the most familiar with that state law. So again, if you started in Texas and then you went distributed, you're probably gonna keep that in Texas even if you went fully distributed. If the owner is from Maine, then and their main contact, their main attorneys in Maine, then they're probably gonna say, hey, let's set this up and incorporate in Maine. If you have a distributed attorney, somebody that's in another state, they might you know, try to say, hey, you need to set it up in my state, or they might say, you know what, let's go to Nevada, let's go here, let's go there. Uh, the attorney's really gonna be the one that kind of brokers that decision. Excellent. And from a tax perspective, I'm gonna add on to that, um, you know, just to give you an example, we're currently working with a company that has three owners and they're located in three different states. And one of the owners is located in Texas where it's a no tax, no income taxes are in that state. And they're like, well, let's move the company away from high tax taxing state uh, X to Texas uh, and hopefully save some taxes there. There may be some potential savings there, but again, back to the previous question, the way you apportion your income, it doesn't really, it might not matter where you're based. It may be where your customers are based and that from a tax saving, tax saving perspective. Very good point. Yep. Mm, good to know. Cool. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. I think that kind of wraps it up for our questions today. Um, and we're reaching the end of the hour and let's see if there's any last question. Mm -hmm. People feel free to throw them out now, but I think we're good. Um, so let's go ahead and just wrap it up a little bit early. And um, I want to thank you guys. This has been one of the most informative webinars we've ever had. <laughs> um, and Great. let's thank talk you. about maybe uh, doing it again sometime when GoToWebinar <laughs> has, uh, you know, gotten better, taking some happy pills, and uh, my network <laughs> decided to be nice to me. <laughs> Oh, but thanks a lot. Um, this has been awesome and I really appreciate it. And um, everyone, we will send out a, an electronic goodie bag afterwards with a whole bunch of resources, all the things we had in the, 
all the things that the gentleman today referred to in the webinar will be there. And um, then, yeah. And uh, if you need to get in touch with them, we very much encourage you to do so. They're great. They're our customers and we only have awesome customers. So, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Sounds good. Right. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, you guys. We'll see you later. Have a great day, everyone. All right. Take care. Yep. Bye-bye.